Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. Uh, by the way, the Linkies after the service are going to, they want to reveal uh, whether they're having a boy or a girl, the next one. So you're going to get a cupcake out of it, all right? And uh, go out to Fellowship Hall afterwards, and uh, they're going to reveal the gender of their baby, and they're going to do it with cupcakes. I like that style. <laughs> Amen. And uh, so grab a cupcake, come on out, or come out to Fellowship Hall, get a cupcake, and find out whether they're adding a boy or a girl, okay? That'll be after service tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, please, for the scripture reading. <clears throat> this evening, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The verses Brother Booth wants us to read are verses 1 through 4. So I'll begin on 1, you join me on 2, I'll read 3, and we'll end together on verse number 4. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 1, would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means has the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, whom ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. We thank you, Lord, for giving us your words tonight. And I pray, Lord, that it would be as you've promised it to be, quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, I pray that each of us would once again affirm our belief that the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, and that if you say it, then we are to do it, and we are to follow it. And so give us uh, those surrendered hearts. Give us that submissive spirit that will do as your word commands us to do. Be with Brother Booth as he prepares to preach. Lord, use the special now to continue to prepare our hearts that we'll be ready to receive your truth this evening. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. to the test for 
the God of the mountains is still God in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the God of the good times he's still God in the bad times the God of the day is still God of the night the God of the day is still God of the night. Amen. Thank you, sister. Appreciate that. So good to see you back tonight. Appreciate you being here. Who are the folks that are revealing the... the uh, okay, you folks are revealing tonight that, huh? My, um, my good friend, Pastor Dan Woodward, is where I uh, host our football camp. And uh, Brother Woodward has three daughters, and uh, they're all married now. And uh, the, his oldest daughter had a little girl, and then uh, uh, they found out that she's going to have a child again. And his middle daughter is also going to have a child. And uh, so the two brother-in-laws in the, uh, that, that are expecting children now were fussing at uh, Christmas time, you know, they came home and, and you know, yeah, well, I'll, I'll be sure to have a boy. You can't do nothing but produce girls, you know, and they're, they're going at it. So, so Sunday morning, Christmas morning, you know, it was church, and uh, Brother Woodward comes out to the platform. He tells me, he said, there's a, a big box all wrapped up like a present, you know, and he said, he said normally I, I don't open presents in front of everybody because you never know what kind of dumb thing might be in there, you know, brother. <laughs> And so he, uh, but he said he noticed it, it said from, from uh, Austin and Rachel, that's his daughter and son-in-law. And so he thought, well, okay, everybody's yelling, open it, you know. So he opens it up and out come balloons and say, it's a boy. And then there's a card on it that says, I have now attained favorite son-in-law status. <laughs> so amen, uh, that's fun. Praise the Lord. I was, I was preaching a missions conference for him, and I was over at uh, Austin and Rachel's house, and their little girl, I think she's maybe, she might be three, and she was sitting at the, at the, the breakfast table, and, and uh, Rachel asked me how my health was doing, and I said, I'm doing fine. She said, well, because I've had a little bit of kidney problems in the past. She said, how are your kidneys doing? I said, they're fine, and her little girl said, and what are their names? She said, she said, no, honey, we're talking about Brother Booth's kidneys. She said, yeah, so what are their names? And she wouldn't give up. She kept saying, well, what are their names? I said, Fred and Bob. <laughs> that, that satisfies you. Okay. So <laughs> we moved on after that. Uh, they're fun, aren't they? You never know. My wife and I were watching our, our uh, six-year-old granddaughter named Kylie, and uh, my wife decided she'd uh, go in and get a little bit of rest, and, and I was watching Kylie. So she came up, she says, now, Papa, you're the patient, and I'm the doctor. I said, okay. She says, I need to check out your heart. She feels my heart. She says, you need 39 shots. <laughs> so she's acting like she's giving me shots, you know, and I'm acting like I'm crying. And she stops, and she looks, and she says, really, Papa? You're 61 years old. <laughs> she says, now deal with it. <laughs> I told my son, I said, she's heard that somewhere before. Oh, <laughs> uh, you never know about them. They're fun. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad you came tonight. and Appreciate you being here. I sure want to encourage you to be faithful through the week. And, uh... I'd mentioned to you this morning, you know, if there's any night you choose to miss, don't miss tonight. So I appreciate you being here. And I want to tell you, if there's any night you choose to miss, don't miss tomorrow night. 
Amen. Amen. So I hope you won't miss tomorrow night. I hope you'll be here. I really believe when God's in a meeting that uh, every single part of it, God has a purpose for every one of us. And uh, so I hope that you'll be faithful. Let's let the Lord do something in our hearts this week. It's sure a waste of time, isn't it, for us just to meet and have some fellowship and God not meet with us. And uh, so let's, let's just be here and let's be praying each and every day, invite folks, just ask the Lord to meet with us. And I do want to preach a message tonight that I believe is absolutely critical, surely not because I'm preaching it, but because of the truth of the Scripture. And uh, I have a dear friend of mine that I've preached for many times. He shared with me, he says, my adult children that are members of his church, they're very faithful. He said, my daughter came to me and she said, Dad, you know, I, I don't understand why you've got to preach on things that, you know, sometimes uh, aggravate people, that, that upset people. And, you know, why do we have to, to preach against things like, like worldly music and worldly dress and, and those kind of things? You know, she said, Dad, we've got friends and they go over there to the River Point Church. You know, or to the, to the Grace Church. Or, you know, all those churches that don't have any real affiliation, which really affiliates them all. And, and she said, Dad, why is it, you know, they go over there and, you know, they've got the, basically a rock band on stage. They call it their, their worship and praise and worship team. And, and, and she said, Dad, you know, the preacher doesn't preach against that stuff. And, and you know, they go to movies and preach doesn't preach against that stuff. And, and you know, they just kind of, uh, everybody's happy there. And they all, they all talk about Jesus. They got a great crowd, Dad. And she said, you know, they, they, they talk about Jesus too. And they seem to love Jesus. And, and, and Dad, we're all going to go to the same heaven, aren't we? So what does it really matter? Well, that's a valid question. And I want to tell you something. There are thousands of independent Baptists that are thinking the same thing. Does it really matter? You know, we, where we live, we drive into our neighborhood. When we drive into our neighborhood, each and every time, I almost have to tie my wife up and put her in the back seat. Because we pass the Bel Air Baptist South Academy or South Campus, I'm sorry, South Campus, that's what they call it. And, and they have a big gymnasium there, and they've got a coffee shop inside, and they've got a workout room, and, and they've got a big sign out front that says, Come join Bel Air Baptist Dance Academy. It so irritates my wife, I almost have to tie her up and put her in the back seat. Honey, do you see that sign? Yes, honey, we've driven in here 150 times. I've seen that. It makes me, what's a Baptist church? A dance academy. I'm going to call that pastor. No, honey, you're not going to call the pastor. He ain't going to listen to you. But what's going on in our, our society? I mean, we see those no-name churches everywhere. And most of them have a crowd. And people are wondering, what's going on? My son, son is a young pastor in Iowa. I, I don't get on a lot of blogs and that kind of stuff. It's, you know, I, I just don't want to. My son, he texted me a little while ago, and there was a young man in Nevada. His dad pastors a fairly large church in Las Vegas. His dad is somewhat known among independent fundamental Baptists out in the West. And, and he worked with his dad for several years after he got out of Bible college. Then he went and started his own church. And, and, uh, and, and he started a blog and said, we're starting the new independent fundamental Baptist movement. The new independent Baptist movement, that's what we call it. And he said, we're not going to put a, an, an emphasis on the non-essentials. We're going to see souls saved and... That's our thrust. We just want to see souls safe. And we're not going to emphasize those non-essential things. Well, let me tell you, folks. Number one, that's nothing new. That's what the old New Evangelical Movement started out as. That, that's a Billy Graham philosophy. 
that the end justifies the means. As long as somebody's getting saved, it doesn't matter if you compromise on, on worldliness or whatever. It simply means we're not going to have anything to do with separation. But I want to just help you tonight. The Word of God tells us that our Lord and Savior, when He walked this earth, He did so many marvelous works that all the libraries in the world can't contain it all. So our God favored us by condensing it all down into this King James Bible. I want to tell you, nothing in that book is non-essential. Everything's essential. He chose it to be in there. If my God chose it to be in there, it's essential. Where it defines nudity and nakedness in the Bible, that's essential. Where it talks about modesty, that's essential. It may not be what we like to hear, but it's essential. God put it in there. So what's going on? I mean, that's a valid question. Does it really matter? Well, the only way we know that anything matters is to go to the Word of God. And here in 2 Corinthians is a very personal letter. Uh, it's from the heart of Paul to this church in Corinth that he dearly loved. He helped establish the church. At this point, 20 years of ministry are behind Paul. He's beginning his final 10 years. He's probably in his late 50s at this point. He has by this time developed a very deep, abiding, personal relationship with his Savior. And here he's given his heart to the church. His personal experience with God. You know, 1 Corinthians is devoted to church problems. 2 Corinthians is devoted to Paul's personal life. In 1 Corinthians, it's telling the church what they should be. In 2 Corinthians, he's telling the church what he is. In 1 Corinthians, it's written for correction. But in 2 Corinthians, it's written as a personal testimony. And Paul was used of God to help start this church. And it's in this city of Corinth where there was much trade and it was in a, a prime location where a lot of foreigners traveled through and a lot of business was done, a lot of activity, and thereby a lot of wickedness. And you know, sometimes we think we've got to live in the most wicked and vile time ever in history. But I want you to know, if you go back and study, it was just as corrupt and vile and wicked in the day of Paul in the city of Corinth. In fact, the, the Greek verb to Corinthianize literally meant to lay in bed with a prostitute. So the, the, the city of Corinth had that reputation. It was a wicked place. It was known for its, its uh, foreigners and travelers, and it was known for its fornication and idolatry and adultery and effeminacy and homosexuality and stealing and covetousness and drunkenness. So how do we know that? Well, go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you're washed. He said, but that's what you came out of, the Corinthian church. That's who you used to be. That's what's going on in the city, in the city of Corinth. And all of that was a, a draw on the church. It affected the church. Just like when we go out, we, we have to work in this old world. It pulls on us. You know, whether we understand or realize it or not, you watch a couple hours of TV a day, I'm telling you, it is pulling on you. This world's philosophy, it, it has a draining effect on the Christian that's trying to do right. And that's what was happening to the Corinthian church. And Paul was burdened about them. And they were becoming far too tolerant of what was going on around them. 
it, interesting in, in 2 Corinthians 11 there that we read. Notice in verse 4 where he says, uh, if, if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached or receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Now what's he mean by that? That word bear means to, to stay afloat, to, to bear up, to hold up. And what he's saying is, if those are coming that are trying to undermine what I've taught you, don't let them pull you down. Don't let them intimidate you. Don't let them drag you down. You bear up. You hold up. You stay true. So here we see Paul addresses this church in Corinth. His heart is heavy. He's burdened for them. They're becoming far too tolerant of the world around them. And what's going on? It's affecting the church. Now notice Satan's attack is always the same. His method of attack never changes. He's not got any smarter. He's just real good at what he does. And it's important for us to understand that we are in a spiritual battle. When you got saved, whether you choose it or not, you join the other side when you trusted Christ, and we are in a spiritual war. And so, preceding all of this in chapter 10, notice he says in verse uh, 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down, notice these words, imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So the war, the attack of the devil, is a spiritual war. And I want you to know it's not an attack on your outside. It's an attack on the inside. He attacks your soul. That's what the devil's attacking. You see, the soul is made up of our mind, how we think, our heart, how we feel, and our will, how we act. And so the devil is attacking our soul. And that's why he said over there in, in, in verse 3, uh, he said, I fear lest by any means a serpent beguiled Eve, who the, that beguiled Eve uh, through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted. Mind. Do you notice those words? Imaginations, knowledge, thought, obedience, mind, heart, the will. You see, the devil knows if he can, if he can get your mind, then he's going to eventually get all of you. The battle starts with our thinking process our thoughts, our imaginations. And that's where the devil fights us. In our mind it begins. We all know if you decide to go on a diet, I'm sorry for using that kind of language in church. I'll wash my mouth out with cake later. So. But you know if you try to go on a diet and you really want to lose weight, and somebody brings their favorite dessert and sets it in front of you, you know what you're going to do? Depends on what you want to do at that time the most. You're going to act on your greatest desire at that moment. Amen? If your greatest desire is to please your appetite, you're going to jump in. If your greatest desire is to lose weight, you'll push it away. We act on our greatest desire at a given moment. And, and, and the thing the Bible tells us is what we think affects our heart, our desires, and that affects our actions. And the devil knows that. Remember in the book of Genesis when the, the, the Lord saw the, that uh, he was going to pour out a flood on mankind and send judgment, and what he said is the imaginations of their heart were continually wicked. You know, there in Proverbs it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So that's why the scripture says when we get saved in Romans 12, 
I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of our minds. So the attack, the battle is always in the way that we think. That's what the devil shoots for. When it says here that we've got to pull down strongholds, a stronghold was when, the, when they would capture, a, a, a conquer an enemy, they would set up a fortress. It was their headquarters, and that, they owned that. That's where they, they ran their operation from. It was a stronghold, a fortress. And the devil wants to set up strongholds in our thinking. Now, the truth is, every one of us, when we get saved, we've already got strongholds set up in here. And now that we're saved, we've got to renew our mind because there's those wrong kinds of thinking. A lot of people fight different emotional challenges in their life, and a lot of it's related to strongholds that they've had for years. That the, that the, the Lord wants us to pull those down. But we can't pull them down with our flesh. We can't pull them down carnally. So there's this attack, and that's what Paul warns them about. There's this attack of the, uh, of the devil. The, the enemy's goal is always to establish strongholds in the soul, the mind, the heart, the will. Because wrong thinking will produce wrong choices for life. Wrong thinking will always produce wrong actions in life. Wrong thinking will always produce disastrous results in life. You might remember years ago, there was a guy named Jeffrey Dahmers. He was a mass murderer. And Jeffrey Dahmers was just prior to his execution, a, uh, a, a secular news reporter went into the prison and he's on death row facing execution. And he wanted to interview him, see why he ended up so messed up. And uh, just, just to, to let you know what Jeffrey Dahmers did is, is he murdered a numerous people. And when he would kill them, he would literally cut them up, put them in the freezer, save them for a meal later on. And I don't say that to be gross or, or rude, crude uh, tonight. I just want you to know how messed up his thinking was. And so the interviewer said to him, certainly you must have come from a very abusive home. I'm sure that your, your mom, your dad, they didn't show you any love and there was great abuse. And Jeffrey Dahmer said, no, sir, you're wrong. He said, my mom and dad loved me. I actually come from a loving home. Man, it took back that interviewer, you know, went across, against all of his you know, psychology and psychiatry that he thought he knew. And he said, well, then what in the world happened? How did you get that messed up in your thinking? Well, he said, be honest with you. He said, when I, we, we were a, a loving family, but we didn't go to church. And he said, when I was, was uh, going to public school, he said, I get these real weird thoughts come in my mind. And my teacher convinced me that evolution was true. And so I just knew if evolution's true, there's no God, there's no creator. I don't have to give an account to anybody one day. I don't have any authority that I have to give an account to. So these weird thoughts, I'm going to try them out. What's it matter? I don't have to give an account to anybody. And he said, you know, it, it just got worse and it got worse. And he said, sir, it wasn't until I was in here on death row that some man of God came by and sat down with me and showed me from the Bible that there was a God and that there was forgiveness and that I could even be forgiven. And he said, I deserve the death penalty I'm getting, but I put my trust in Jesus now and I know I'm forgiven. But I didn't know that when I was growing up. You see, what had happened, he had a stronghold. He had a messed up way of thinking that caused him to a place of such corruption. And Paul says to the church, he said, you know, I'm concerned for you. I have a fear that, that, that just like the old devil in his subtle ways messed up, corrupted Eve's mind, the way she was thinking. 
I'm afraid that might be happening to you as a church. What was Paul's motivation in all of this for his people? For those in Corinth? Well, I want you to notice there in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 11. He said, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. You see, Paul didn't like to be in the defense mode. Paul never liked to make it about him. He always wanted to make it about Jesus. But there had been those who had come in and undermined what Paul had taught the people. And so they began to, well, you know, Paul, he's just all about himself, you know, and he's just going to be mad because you're, you're going to think on your own and you're not going to just follow everything he said, you know. And, and so Paul starts out in the defense mode. He said, bear with me a little in my folly. Allow me to, 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 to explain to you why I'm telling you what I'm telling you. And he says in verse 2, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. You see, let me tell you the heart of a pastor. I pastored for 20 years. No pastor wants to micromanage anybody's life. I mean, we have a life of our own. We've got things to do. No pastor's desire that loves God and loves people is trying to micromanage everybody's life. But I want to tell you, as a pastor, God puts in his heart a love for that flock and a love for those people. And that's what Paul had. And he's saying to him, I have a godly jealousy over you. I, I espoused you to the Jesus I know, not another Jesus. I espoused you to the Jesus I know. And I want to be able to present you a chaste virgin to Christ. He said, I don't want you to corrupt it. These who have come through and are attacking, trying to put strongholds in your mind that aren't true. Paul says, I've got a godly jealousy of you. I'm jealous for your well-being. And I'm jealous for the glory of our Lord. I have a godly jealousy over you. And when a pastor has a burden for his people and love for his people, don't get offended when your pastor preaches on your sin. He's not doing that because he's trying to hurt. He's trying to, he's got a godly jealousy over his people. He don't want the world to get them. And the world's getting far too many of them. There's a godly jealousy. If your pastor pulls you aside and said, Brother, I love you, but man, I know you've been missing the last couple of weeks on, on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. Is everything okay? Don't get offended by that. That's a pastor's heart. He has a godly jealousy over his people. It's not that he's trying to watch every little move that you're making. No, but he wants you to make it as a Christian. He wants God's blessing on you. There's a godly jealousy there. And then notice Paul said, and I have a fear. Now as parents, we understand that parental fear. We see somebody dragging one of our kids the wrong direction. We see our children start going down the wrong way. Man, you're just about willing to do anything in your life to get them back on track. Oh, it grieves and it hurts. And Paul had that parental fear. So he watched over the church. He said, I don't want you to get back on track. I mentioned Brother Woodward called me one time. It was, or he told me about um a dear young lady in his church, this, her, her parents got mad at Brother Woodward. And they left the church over some dumb reason. But their teenage daughter said, I don't want to leave. I love our youth group. I love my pastor. I love my church. I don't want to leave. They said, fine, stay if you want to. She did. Brother Woodward and his wife Cindy kind of really took Jane under their wing and almost like their own daughter, loved her, and she just was teachable. And in fact, she's our, our uh, football camp secretary. I'm going to tell you, the best secretary I've ever seen in my life, honestly. But, but she just yielded herself. And so when she got to college, she met a young man, and she thought she was in love with him. And Brother Woodward met him, and he pulled her in his office. He said, Jane, you know I love you like a daughter. 
I don't want to hurt you. But please hear me. I'm a man. I, I see through men. And, and there's some things that I see that's just not right for you. And, and, and I, I'm not God, Jane, but I love you. And, and I just think, man, there's some things. This isn't the right guy for you, Jane. Oh, she wept and she cried, but she listened to her preacher and she dumped the guy. It wasn't within a year that God brought the right young man along. They've been married now for all these years, got their kids who are growing up and getting ready to, to head out to Bible college. And man, they're just faithful servants and they're just such a blessing. The guy that the preacher warned her about, he's homeless on the streets of Miami as a heroin addict. It was just a godly jealousy. I just don't want you to end up in the wrong place where God can't bless you. And that was Paul's motivation. Now notice the mission of the enemy. What's he want to do? Let's look down there at verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus... Now listen, the devil always wants to turn you from the Jesus of the Bible. You see, if you accept in your mind another Jesus, you'll receive another spirit. You'll receive another gospel. And Satan has hated the Jesus of the Bible since Genesis chapter 3 when God told him that the seed of woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent. And from that time on, it's been war. And you know, and if you know a little bit about your Bible, the devil tried to kill Jesus at his birth. He tried to kill him in the, in the boat when the waves were crashing in. He tried to take him out to the wilderness and tempt him for 40 days and tell him, hey, you know, you, you just lay aside your deity. You have the right to do what you want to do. He, he tried to, uh, to kill him at Gethsemane. When he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood and said, let this, let this cup pass from me. Now, all of that didn't work. So what he's doing is he wants to attack the truth of who Jesus really is. Colossians 1.8 says, Beware, lest any man spoil you. Spoiling is what the, the, the people would do when they would conquer a city. They would spoil the city. They would take the valuable things out of the city of their enemies and make it their own. He said, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, empty, self-centered, all wrapped up for you, deceit. Listen, you want know kind of preaching you're going to hear from a Joel Osteen? It's all about you. Oh, he'll, he'll fulfill all your dreams. He'll make all your wishes come true. Everything for you. Everything for you. Let me tell you something. God didn't save me so that he could fit into my plans. He saved me so I could fit into his plans. All vain deceit after the traditions of men. After the rudiments, rudiments is foundation. After the foundation, the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. Satan's the God of this world. His philosophies that he builds the whole world system on is always contrary to the word of God. And we've got independent Baptists just falling into it right and left. Galatians 1 warns about another gospel. In Psalm 115, it talks about when they make their idols and their gods, they'll make them like unto themselves. That's exactly the kind of stuff that's going on today. They're trying to make God relatable to you. They're pulling him down into your kind of life. No, no, the truth is his ways are past finding out. His thoughts are far beyond our thoughts. He's a holy, righteous God. So listen to me real close now. So here's what we've got today. We've got another Jesus being preached that offers a salvation without repentance, church services without conviction, grace without truth, sanctification without separation, 
compassion that embraces compromise, growth without trials, godliness without persecution, preaching without confronting sin. The popular religion of the day offers a perversion of grace, a rebellion toward any kind of law, resistance toward accountability and responsibility, pessimism toward authority and authoritative preaching, and acquiescence rather than separation from the world. But I'm telling you folks, that doesn't represent the Jesus of the Bible. That's another Jesus. Can I tell you, not everybody who talks about Jesus is talking about the Jesus of the Bible. They may be sincere, and they may think they are, but they don't know the Scripture. My son was about to get engaged and a number of years ago he he said dad I was at the mall and I was looking at some some rings and the guy there that has the the jewelry place he's a Pakistani Muslim I invited him to church I think he would actually come if you went and saw him well I'd rather have a root canal than go to the mall (laughs) But one day, my wife and I were out, and she needed to stop by the mall, so we stopped by. And I said, let's go meet this fella. So I walked up, and he's standing behind his counter, and I introduced myself. He said, oh, he said, your team's dad. Oh, and your dad, we speaks well of his dad and mom. And oh, I love him. And and, hey, we family. So he said, what's mine is yours. My eyes, my wife's eyes are getting bigger. He pulls out a beautiful, huge emerald ring. Beautiful. Sets it on the counter. Sister, you like? She said, I like. He said, what's well, mine is yours. I said, Jamal, listen, we're just here because we, we want to meet you. I want to be your friend. I'm thinking, you know, I don't want the guy to think I'm after something. I want to be able to win him to Christ. My wife has never forgiven me. <laughs> He actually came to church. Every time he'd come to church, he came like four weeks in a row. Every time he'd come, I'd feel led to preach on the deity of Christ. I said, Jamal, I want to take you out to lunch. Oh, I like that. So we went out to lunch. We're sitting at lunch, and I said, Jamal, I said, I would really like for you to go to heaven with me one day. He said, oh, yes. I said, but that means you have to trust Jesus as your Savior. He said, oh, we believe in Jesus. He said, the Koran talks about Jesus. He said, um, oh, oh, I could show you in, in our Koran. I said, Jamal, do you believe that Jesus was a good man? Oh, yes. I said, you believe he was a good teacher? Yes. I said, I said Jamal, you believe that Jesus was even a good prophet? Yes, he was. I said, but you don't believe he's God? No. I said, well, let me tell you, then you don't believe the Jesus of the Bible? He said, no. I said, Jesus claimed to be God. I showed him some verses. I said, so either he is who he said he is, or he's not a good man at all. He's a liar and a deceiver. He said, oh, I think on that. Jamal ended up getting saved. I had the privilege to baptize him. But let me tell you something. The Jesus he was talking about wasn't the Jesus of the Bible. You see, people talk about Jesus doesn't mean they're talking about the Jesus of the Bible. Don't get caught up in that. Well, they just see, they talk about loving Jesus, but they have a perverse concept of who Jesus is. We've got to go to the Bible to find out who Jesus is. My Bible said he's the, the way, the truth, and the life. If you've got another Jesus, you don't have the only way. You don't have the truth. You don't have the life to follow. I was in a pretty well-known independent Baptist church in the south the pastor said um, uh, this morning we're all going to have all the the adult classes together fairly large uh, church and and he said um, my brother is visiting from out of town for the weekend he's a pastor at such and such Baptist church some other uh, state he said I'm going to have him do Sunday school so we're all sitting there his brother gets up and he says now he said um, I want you to know that God is love I said, amen, I'm good with that. 
He said, in fact, he's perfect in his love. I said, he sure is. He said, and because he's perfect in his love, he can never be more pleased with you or less pleased with you. I said, that's heresy. That is not true. But that's what's being preached. It doesn't matter what you do, the Lord loves you. Just, folks, listen, I love my children, whether they're obedient or not, but that doesn't mean I'm pleased with them. I mean, if that was the case, why is there reward and loss of reward? If that was the case, why does the Lord ever chastise his children like he talks about in Hebrews 12? That's not Bible truth. So what's our responsibility? What's our mandate? Well, 2 Peter 3.18 says that we're to grow in the grace of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. How can you follow who Jesus is if you don't know what the Bible says about him? In 2 Corinthians 5.20 it says, Now then ye are ambassadors for Christ. As an ambassador, an ambassador is one that represents his king while he's living in a foreign land. And I want to tell you, thank God, friend, this is not my home. I'm just passing through here. I'm a stranger and a pilgrim. And I'm here as an ambassador. I represent the King of kings and Lord of lords. But I want to ask you, how in the world can you represent him if you don't know who he really is? I want you to go to a verse that's oftentimes, or, or a passage that'll help you to understand some. You know, so many of these folks, they say, well, you know, you independent fundamental Baptist, you got standards and all that kind of stuff. You're, you're legalist. Well, I want you to understand that just shows the ignorance that they have concerning the Scripture. The Pharisees were legalist. They believed you had to keep a set of rules in order to earn your way to heaven. I don't know an independent Baptist preacher that preaches that. It's not legalism to have some standards and convictions about living godly in an ungodly world because you want to please the Lord that you love. But they say, well, we're under grace. You know, that, that's, we're under grace. A lot of them like to name their church grace. Grace this, grace that. Well, let's look at what the Bible says about grace. In Titus chapter 1, I'm sorry, Titus chapter 2, look at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now that kind of messes up the Calvinist, doesn't it? The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Man, that's good. Isn't, aren't you glad that God had grace for you? Then notice about this wonderful grace that saves. Look at verse 12. Teaching us. What's it going to teach us? Now we're saved teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That must mean that we're expecting him to come at any minute. It means we don't have to wait until the tribulation's over to expect him to come. In verse thir uh, 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Grace teaches us separation. Grace teaches us to get out of the old lifestyle. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. Grace teaches us to honor him, to be looking for him. But we've got to know who he is to represent who he is. How do you know him? Interesting. Go with, with me to Philippians chapter 3. Remember that wonderful verse where Paul says there in verse 10 of Philippians 3, that I may know him the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. But interesting, what leads up to that? Look at verse 7 of chapter 3. But what things were gained to me, I, those I counted loss for Christ. 
how to circle that word loss. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss. There it is again. For the excellency of the what? Knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss, there it is again, of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You see, Paul said, I had to lose some things to reach the excellency of the knowledge of who he is. And what's being preached and promoted in these churches today is, hey, you don't have to lose anything. You just be who you are. Doesn't matter who you are. If you're a homosexual, if you're a transgender, God loves you, whoever you are, just the way you are. Well, I want to tell you, he does love us, but he doesn't want us to stay that way. And you've got to lose some things. You've got to leave some things behind. The Lord never called one disciple without saying, forsake all and follow me. You've got to leave the old life. You've got to lose that if you're going to be an ambassador for Christ and really know him. Really know who he is. That means there's no more making him what you want him to be, but you let him make you what he wants you to be. And he said, then, that I may know him. I want to look at one more passage of Scripture. James chapter 1. This is a wonderful passage here. James chapter 1. Look at verse 19. James 1, 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, now he's talking to saved people, isn't he? Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That's that loss, isn't it? Leave all that. And receive with meekness, that's a humility, the engrafted word, which is able to save what? Your souls. All those strongholds and things that we don't think clear and we don't think right, we got wrong ideas and wrong philosophies that this whole world's been pouring into us all our life. Way you get over that is by the engrafted word. I don't know a whole lot about medical things, but I understand if somebody gets burned real bad, they've got to scrape off that old dead skin so infection doesn't set in before they can put a graft of new skin on that will heal that old wound. And the way the Lord heals our wrong thinking is by His precious Word. Let me tell you something, folks. You need to read it. You need to study it. You need to listen to singing about it. You need to get doctrine poured into you all the time, all during the day. Turn on good godly music. Don't listen to the trash of this world. Turn off your stinking TV for a while. Listen to godly music. Hey, I want to tell you, you want something to pull you out of discouragement, depression? Get some music that's right doctrine and it's godly and holy and lift your hearts. That's what the psalmist did. The engrafted word. Now, I'm going to tell you why we've got a bunch of young people growing up in independent Baptist churches. We, we take them to camps. We Parents sacrifice to homeschool them, put them in Christian school. We make sure they go to youth conferences. We hear all these different things. They turn 18 and out the door they go and they join some church that doesn't require anything out of them. Yeah, but they talk about Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. And here's the problem. The reason we got independent Baptists bailing out right and left is because we don't study our Bibles. We don't know the Word of God. We don't know how to, how to recognize when it's, when it's false, when it's counterfeit. We don't study the Bible for ourselves. Well, the preacher studies, and I come and hear it, and that's wonderful, and thank God you've got a pastor that stands true, and he stands by the book, and he studies and prepares. Thank God, but that's not enough for you for every day of the week. You need to have your personal time to study the Word of God. 
man, get up in the morning and open it up and say, God, speak to me what I need today. You read a word and say, man, I don't know how. The, why, how's that? Why is that in there? Look it up in an 1828 dictionary. See what that word means and how it fits in with who it's written to. Man, it becomes alive to you. It becomes a part of you. I'll confess to you. When I went to Bible college, I grew up a preacher's kid. When I went to Bible college, I was intimidated. Because I thought if they find out I'm a preacher's kid and I'm this ignorant of the Bible, I'm going to be embarrassed. And I say that to my shame. Listen, at four days old, I was in church. You know, nobody told my mom and dad that, you know, he may get a, a little fungus in the nursery. They didn't care. They stuck me in the nursery. I survived. And I, there was Bibles around me all my life, preacher. Everywhere I went, I was sitting here tonight listening to that song. The old rugged cross. Man, it just took me back. I grew up around those great hymns. I was around the Bible all my life, and here I go to Bible college, and I had a heart for the Lord. That's why I was at Bible college. I had surrendered to preach, but I, as a teenager, it was like two days and missed three days, and, you know, catch up one day and miss the next four, and I just, I had no real depth of, of, of relationship with that blessed book. And I'll never forget, first semester I was there, and old Dr. John O. Rice got up. He looked over those glasses and those old saggy cheeks and the old tears would drip. As I never saw him preach that the tears didn't drip off his cheeks. And he said, young people, I want you to know something. In John chapter 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And then it goes on and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he said, you know, Jesus is the living word, and this Bible is the written word. And your love for Jesus is measured by your love for that written word. And it was like a dagger in my heart. And I remember going back to my room, and I shut the door behind me, and I fell on my face, and I was there a good long time, and I wept, and I said, Dear God, you must feel like I don't even love you because my relationship with that book has been so shallow and inconsistent. But by the grace of God, I don't want it to be that way anymore. We need a revival of independent Baptist folks who will come to an old-fashioned altar and say, Dear Lord, I need to get to study in my Bible. For me Lord I want to renew my commitment to my church that's standing in the old-fashioned way that I'll not be drawn subtly by somebody corrupting my mind with worldly philosophy vain deceit after the traditions of this world I want to commit myself afresh and new to allowing my preacher to teach me be a wonderful thing if a whole bunch of Baptists would quit going to the internet to get their spiritual food and let the one that God designed in a local church be your pastor. Amen. We're seeing it right and left. Bailing out. Yeah, but they're getting a big crowd. Can I tell you something? Joe's Bar has a big crowd. Doesn't mean it's spiritual. We've gotten a mindset that we think that Gain is godliness. And our goal has become gain rather than godliness. But we've got to get back to loving and following the Jesus of the Bible so we can be ambassadors that represent him. I don't want to go to a place that my Lord won't go to. I don't want to, go, I don't want to dress in a way that my Lord wouldn't be pleased with. I want to listen to music that my Lord wouldn't honor. It's about him. It's not about us. About him, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the precious word of God. We so need thee, Lord. Forgive us when we allow so many things to crowd our schedule. 
that are so foolish and insignificant that we don't take time to study thy precious word. Lord, there is a great attack of the devil in our, our time. Churches right and left that are dropping the old convictions and just for a crowd. Would you help us, Lord? We sure want to see everybody saved we can see saved. But would you help us, Lord, to stay true to you? To study and understand the Word of God. Would you help folks to be committed to a church that is faithfully standing for the Word of God? For a man of God who's faithfully feeding the flock from the Word of God. Help us tonight, Lord. I don't know what you want to do in this invitation. But would you help us to be humble enough to respond the way you want us to? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody looking. I wonder tonight if there's anybody here that would say, Brother Booth, be honest with you, I'm not sure if I'm saved. I can't tell you that I'm 100% sure if I died that I'd go to heaven. I can't take you to a place that I'm sure that somebody showed me from the Bible how to trust Christ and with a repentful heart I called on the Lord and I was born again and saved. And I'm concerned about that. I don't want to go to hell. And if I could see from the Word of God how to be saved, I need to be saved. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up, anybody like that tonight? Just slip your hand up and put it down. I wonder how many tonight would say, Brother Booth, I'm saved. But I needed that tonight. That helped me to see some things clearly. Brother Booth, it, I need to get into a consistent study of the Word of God. I've failed in that. Brother Booth, I, I need to, to be a faithful ambassador for Christ. And somewhere during the message, maybe you've been struggling. Well, I don't know, maybe I ought to consider that church over there. They got the praise and worship band. Oh, Jamal, that, that Muslim told me, he said, you know, preacher, he said, I, I visited three other churches. Their music sounded exactly what I heard in the club. But your church was different. So I wonder who would say tonight, Brother Booth is a Christian, I needed that. Pray for me. God speak to my heart tonight. Pray for me. Would you slip your hands up, Christians? God spoke to your heart. God bless you. Thank God for you. Many hands. Thank the Lord for you. You may put them down. Maybe there's some others. Maybe some others will be humble enough and honest enough with the Lord to say, Lord, I don't know if you feel like I love you very much. My love for you is measured by my love for the Word of God and where it has its place in my day every day. Maybe there's others. Maybe something I didn't preach on specifically. Maybe some worldly practices and habits have come into your life that you know he's not pleased with. And you just say, Brother Booth, somewhere during the message, it may not have been what you preached on specifically, but the Holy Spirit's dealing with me. And I didn't raise my hand before, but I'm raising it now. Include me tonight. Include me in the prayer. Would you slip your hand up anybody else? God bless you. Glad we waited several others. Let's stand for prayer. After we pray, Brother Bob will sing, God spoke to your heart. It's revival. It's not time for us to sit in our seat, God dealing with us. Let's let God have his way. Let's come and hum humble ourselves in an old-fashioned altar, ask for his grace to help us. Maybe some just need to come and renew their commitment, Lord. I'm going to stay faithful to an old-fashioned church like this. I'm going to stay faithful to the ministry of an old-fashioned preacher that stands true without compromise. I, I'm, I'm, Lord, I'm going to get committed to the Word of God even more. Father, we pray that you'll bless now this invitation. Do what you need to do in hearts. Give victories, I pray. Seal decisions, Lord. Make a difference in somebody's life because of a decision made tonight. We ask thee in Jesus' name. As the music plays, God spoke to your hearts. You need to come. You come, would you? to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all others need to come you come Loved by you tonight. Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus.
Jesus, I surrender humbly at his feet. I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender. Go ahead and look this way for a minute, if you would. You know, I was I was thinking about Lot when he left Abraham, went to Sodom, and really compromised. And when it came time to influence his loved ones to get out of Sodom, he had no testimony. He had no power in his testimony. We have, we have more what they consider mega churches. A mega church is a church that runs 2,000 or more in attendance on a Sunday. We have more of those in America than ever in our history. How is that impacting our country? You see very little impact. The testimony isn't there. Are we, are we off live stream now? Okay. I was going to say something. I'm not going to say it if I'm... Somebody be watching it that I don't want to see it. But, um, you know, uh, I was telling with Brother Booth that Barna Research, who does a lot of research among what they call evangelical Christians, Christians who preach the gospel, and how in the areas of entertainment there is no difference between those who name the name of Christ and those who don't. And therefore, where's, where's our influence in the world? We, we've lost it. I mean, we're, we offer no different, no difference for them. And, and you, I just think when you come to church, you ought to know it's church. You ought to know that it's not like where you were last night uh, on Saturday night if you're in the wrong place. Uh, music, boy, I tell you, that's so important. Uh, Brother, uh, Brother Woodward, who Brother... Uh, Booth was talking about they have started a radio station out of their church. I know many of you have the North Valley Baptist Church app on your phone and listen to that music. Uh, there's another uh, church that has started a radio station. And, you know, there's uh, locally, there's no, there's no Christian music locally. No. Okay? So, oh, I listen to the river. Well, you're up the river. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, the, that's not Christian music, my friend. Just because, and by the way, you say, well, the words. Most times you don't even understand the words. And then other times the words, they're not even mentioning Jesus or God. They're just talking about him and he. And you could sing that about your boyfriend or your, your husband and not know that they're talking about God. Be careful. Be careful. Music influences you. Have, have godly music and get, you know, most of you have a smartphone or you have, app, uh, have things like that. Put those good songs, put those good stations on there and listen to godly music. Uh, it'll help you. 
it'll help you. Uh, you're, you're, don't just leave a void there. You're, you're going to listen to something. Listen to something good. Amen. I won't preach another sermon, but I want to, you know that, but uh, we'll leave it at that, all right? Well, we're going to pray, and then uh, we can uh, go next door, and uh, we'll see what the linkies will reveal to us, okay? So we'll uh, we'll sing our closing song, then we'll give Lisa time to get over there. Uh, she's got to go from the piano over to there, so we'll let her do that. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the message from your word. Thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of your people to be in church on Sunday night. Pray for those unable to be here tonight because of illness. Please, Lord, bring healing to their body that they could be here for the remainder of the revival meeting. Lord, I pray your blessing now on the fellowship time with the Linkies, and Lord, I pray that you'll watch over us as we go home then after that, our separate ways, and continue to work in our hearts. Continue, Lord, to Give us that desire to please you, and I pray that you'll continue to speak to us and meet with us each and every night, and we'll thank you in advance for what I believe you'll do, and I pray it in Jesus' name, amen, amen. 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 It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, shall we? Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. We'll see you next door.